This is uh, Roxana Moran. This is married to a cardiologist. <laughs> and it's about women being married to cardiologists and men being married to cardiologists. And we have these amazing couples. So why don't we first uh, introduce uh, each and every one of you, because I think this is going to be a great, great uh, chat. So let's start on this side. The Sure. David Hayes. Uh, I'm at the, the Mayo Hayes Clinic family. in Rochester, Minnesota. I've been there my entire career, except for a little bit of training. And the area of cardiology is in devices, pacemakers, defibrillators. Welcome. Sharon Hayes. I am also uh, have had my whole career at Mayo Clinic. Um, met David at Mayo Clinic. Um, and I do non-invasive cardiology, prevention, pericardial disease, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and women in heart disease. That's great. Yeah. Um, hi, um, my name is Estefania Oliveros. Um, I'm doing my heart failure fellowship in advanced heart failure and transplant at Mount Sinai Hospital. We met at Temple uh, University here in Philadelphia uh, when we were doing internal medicine. Yeah, uh, my name is Eugene Berlowski. I'm now at Columbia doing my uh, also heart failure fellowship. Oh, uh, yeah. Heart failure couple. <laughs> <laughs> Not just cardiology, but heart failure as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's but great. we met in residency and uh, followed each other uh, throughout. Yeah. Oh, it's really yeah. so nice to have you here. Yeah. I'm Bobby Ye. I'm an interventional cardiologist and uh, it, at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and I direct a research group called the Smith Center for Outcomes Research. Great. I'm Doreen DeFaria Ye. I'm a cardiologist at Mass General Hospital. Bobby and I met at Mass General as uh, interns. Um, I direct the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship Program at MGH and see adult congenital heart patients. I'm Selena Young. I'm an interventional cardiologist, director of interventional cardiology at Palo Alto um, Veterans Hospital and an assistant professor at Stanford. I'm, I'm Freddie Amnusi, Selena's husband. Uh, that's usually my title. Yeah, that is your title. <laughs> I'm an interventional cardiologist as well and um, uh, head of healthcare research at Facebook. Well, welcome everyone. So now we can just relax and kind of talk about how does this work? Does this work being married to a cardiologist? Selena, how does that feel to be married to a cardiologist? <laughs> it totally works. Mm. I can't imagine it any other way. <laughs> Freddie? I'm, I'm pulling my sleeves up here. Before. <laughs> pull up the sleeves. Pull up the sleeves. Freddie, how's, how's it? How, did, how does it work? The career itself, I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed it any other way. So, mm -hmm. but, but I also think none of it's possible if you don't have that rock. So you're a rock for each other. I yeah? freaking hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got, so we're going to come to the most experienced couple. <laughs> 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 and, and then, and, but because it, it, what's beautiful about this group is that we're all in different stages of our careers. So Sharon, uh, you guys, tell us about how, how it works for you. And what it, what was it like in the younger, in, early on when you were less training and you were... <laughs> and we were less experienced. <laughs> but more importantly, when cardiology, women in cardiology were like rare. So I knew I wanted to be a mom and have a family. And I actually tried to like other specialties. Mm. Cardiology was my first rotation as a medicine resident. And I loved it, but I'm kind of a positive person. So I figured I would like other things. And I kept circling back. And then I started dating David, who was already a cardiologist. And then I thought even more, I should not be a cardiologist simply because, <laughs> like, how would we both find jobs? Because, and then I, then I rationalize, yeah. I say, why shouldn't I be a, what I really want to do just because he got there first? So that, uh, there was a lot of that going on in my head that I thought about. We were married while I was a medicine resident. And so, and I had um, my first child at the end of my cardiology fellowship and a second child five years later. And so it was just a really busy time and there were no role models. I think that's the thing that is different now um, with 25% of our of fellow, cardiology fellows being women and half of um, medical students being women. So we were making it up as we went. I think what I had was somebody who wanted me and knew I could be great. 
I mean, talk about a rock. I don't think I've ever called you a rock, but um, <laughs> but the respect and the knowing what I needed, sometimes the nudge um, was really important. I think that's what kept us and keeps us going. I mean, we've been married 35 years, right? Right. <laughs> He's the one that keeps that. Right. Um, and, um, and I think that you have to keep evolving and rethinking as the shifting sands. Um, I will say that in a that I did early on a lot more of the traditional female things at home in terms of managing the household and organizing the carpools. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go there because we want to figure out how do we make house work. Right? That's the whole pay point. somebody else to do it. Yeah, so, so that, was, that, that was my that was the way I went about it. I came about that late. <laughs> Buy your time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you guys are sort of early in your marriage, isn't that right? Yeah, Did that you guys is true. just recently yeah. get married? Yeah. So three years, and yeah. yeah, three years. Mm -hmm. And and so how does that? How, and you're both in in fellowship, mm -hmm. and that's tough, right? And how how is that? How's it working? How are you guys doing? So we do it. Um, I think it's a component of family help uh, because his family lives close by. Um, and the other one is that we have an angel that lives with us. It's a living so nanny. We have a living nanny, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because so you need support. Yeah. You need support. It's too hard to coordinate both schedules when someone is on call, when um, someone needs to submit a paper. Like those are academic mm -hmm. careers. So I definitely want to yeah. kind of come back to you guys because. Um, being married uh, to another fellow, and then of course you don't want to lose your any time as, at your fellowship because because you're a woman or yeah. uh, or the family. And I think it's important to see that uh, that these things do work and that spouses play such an important role in that. But I'll come back to that. But um, uh, Bobby, you guys are married now for a while. Not uh, is it more than ten years now? Twelve. Yeah, 13. 13, 13 years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like the <laughs> so bad, I'm pretty good at that. And there are a couple of young kids. And mm -hmm. so yeah. who's doing what a, in the house? We have an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 1-year-old. Mm. Yeah, so we have this uh, wow. little bit of a break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's yeah. a lot of work. So it is. How does, how, does it, yeah. how does it work? Because I do know that uh, Bobby will say, I'm sorry, I can't come because I've got to. He does he's often. Really, he's pitching in a lot. He yeah. does often. I think that's one thing people may not recognize about um, Bobby, given how um, successful he's been with his research work. But behind the scenes, he does a tremendous amount of work for our family. Um, as a matter of fact, I was joking before, I have no idea where they are for summer camp because he's planned it all. Um, oh. and arranged where they're going oh, and he's nice. taken that role on um, similarly for a lot of the after-school activities soccer and so forth and he will um, manage and take care of of those things and there are plenty of other things that are sort of on my plate that I take care of but I think this concept of parenting equitably and no role really being the mom's role or the dad's role per se but we share mm -hmm every component of it and doing whatever we can. We certainly, we have a lot of help and we've been very fortunate. We mm -hmm. have a live-in nanny as well. Yeah. And in addition, we have um, some babysitters who help drive our kids in the afternoon hours when both of us are working. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm primarily clinical, so I actually have much less flexibility than Bobby has. And we have to add to his accolade, he does good housework too. <laughs> he t yeah, <laughs> on top I don't know of if the housework brilliant. is good quality. Housework. <laughs> Organizer, like, activity, organizer all over activity. it. Yeah, yeah. but it, that's so time consuming. You think about oh, all the time absolutely. to sign kids up for camp and to make oh. sure they have the right size cleats and all of that. There is a whole other full-time job in managing home and managing children and just getting that home schedule um, together 100%. and accounting for that time is important and whether that's there's components of that that's equally shared by the two in a, in a couple and there are other components of that work that's offloaded, if you will, to other people to help. Somehow you have to account for that extra full-time job. Oh, no, 100%. And, uh, and Selena and uh, Freddie, well, how about you guys? Who's Freddie's doing most of the work, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think one difference between us and everyone here is that we met, had a very unlikely meeting, actually, like 
18 years ago, predating us even knowing we wanted to be doctors. We were in London. Freddie lived in Canada at the time. I was from California. And we met during a master's in health policy. And uh, from there, I mean, basically just stuck together since the day we met after that. And um, along that process, I think always supported each other in trying to find what our passions were. And over time, those morphed, and we supported each other each step of the way. And when that finally became cardiology, and then both of us finally deciding to do interventional cardiology, same problem, we thought, how are we going to get a job? Um, we just figured out a way to just give everything we could. And it didn't matter the exact role. It didn't matter what the job was. We just had to get the job done as a unit, essentially. Yes. Yeah, so that's it's really important and great points. But what about parental leave? How did, how did you guys handle that? Because I know you guys. It's handled. challenging. So we have a five, three, and one-year-old. And we, in theory, always knew we wanted to have kids. But really, we're pushing it off because we want to focus on their training. And when it got to be just about the end of General Cardiology Fellowship, I was 34 approaching advanced maternal age. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we realized if we really wanted to do this, we couldn't wait any longer. Uh -huh. And you know, you can work at work during general cardiology fellowship. I think interventional fellowship is, is a really difficult situation. Because at our program, it's Q2 call. Um, so we ended up talking with my program director. We worked it out. I had um, our first child and then started my interventional cardiology fellowship shortly after that. And during that year, uh, Freddie did almost 100% of the childcare when he was about six months old. And oh, then the following can't, year. I can't comment on the quality. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he turned out it's okay. It's the effort that counts. <laughs> still around. Still around. Was up with it. <laughs> and then the following year, he did his interventional cardiology fellowship, and I did all of the childcare, along with a lot of help from my parents who live nearby. Was it two years later? Was it two years Because it was another oh, kid. Only two years it was another kid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's all blur now. <laughs> wow. And uh, basically, you know, during we just recognized that it's equal over a long time, but it's not equal at in any given time. And oh, I so love that. we were really happy. I was happy to take care of all the kids while he was doing fellowship, and vice versa. Uh, parental leave during fellow interventional fellowship was tough. Yeah. Um, you had about a week. Yeah. And it was challenging. I mean, our daughter was in the ICU. He would do cases and then go back to the ICU and go back and do cases. It's challenging. But we made it work um, with a lot of support and I think a community of other interventionalists at our institution who were really in support of what we were trying to do. And you guys, you're also just close to your, uh, yeah. you have a one-year-old, right? So yeah. how, how did you? Did you handle parental leave? I mean, they give paternity leave these days is like five days or something, something. Yeah, like there was re there was really no uh, paternity leave part oh. of it, and this is the one aspect where I think is. Well, as, we're going to talk about that, don't yeah. you? Think we yeah, we need to change that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that is starting to. I, I know that 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 people are starting to feel comfortable at asking for that and talking about that, and but, you know, it's the one aspect where I think that. For us, it just could not be shared evenly. Is is those first few months after uh, all three of our kids were born? I mean, I think that just the physical toll of of nursing and just being the repeated sort of sleep wake cycle is as much as 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 I think the fathers can can help with changing diapers or if there's nursing involved and then there's pumping involved and the, the, there, that whole thing is something I think as men we can try to support, but we just cannot do, fully replace. understand, do, yeah, right. or really fully understand that I think the physical, you said that's such a blur. I remember <laughs> Doreen talking about that's that a so lot, blur, which is actually. like, oh, I just feel mentally like I've yeah. just lost something yep. this year because of yeah. how sleep deprived <laughs> yeah. you felt. And it was something that like I could empathize with, but I couldn't really yeah. solve, you know? Yeah, I yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, I will say there are many things that um, I think one, there's pregnancy, but then in the, that postpartum period, it is an extension of that whole, you know, we talk about the fourth trimester, but it's really that whole first year after one has a baby where the, there really is a need for very different kinds of support, planning, you know, the way you plan your time, even when you come back to work and so forth, that um, it's hard to um, plan for if you haven't been through it. 
And so I think we, you know, we have an 11 year old and we have an almost nine year old. And now many years later we have another baby and gosh, it was a whole lot harder to have a baby when you're after 40 than, than you know, a, a decade ago. And I think it was, it took me, it took both of us a little bit of time to just sort of recognize that this was just as hard, maybe harder than it was the first time around. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just setting expectations that maybe we wouldn't be able to do the things that you planned to do or that you thought you could do in that time period, um, just because the sleep deprivation wouldn't, you know, I would f fall asleep in the early evening and, sure. you know, you just, it's hard to be productive. So I think that's where I think having a partner who's supportive in whatever ways they can be. I know, you know, Bob can't obviously nurse or pump, but I mean, everything short of that is something that I could trust that he would do. Um, and that truly was, um, so important during that time. In terms of paternity leave now for trainees, um, something I think we're very fortunate, our GME office has spent a lot of time thinking about to ensure that the parental leave now is equitable for men and women. And the challenge has been encouraging our male trainees, this is for our fellows, to actually take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. To actually take that full time, be away, mm -hmm. and I've had some um, male fellows where I've said, we don't want to see you before X date, stay home and just try to change that culture so men feel like they can um, take that time without sort of feeling the external pressures that yeah, some of their mentors it, didn't take that time, maybe they shouldn't, but yeah. it's just as important that they do as well. It's so important and this is one of the areas when we talk about changing sort of some of the the social aspects of and, and the societal aspects of how we think parenting actually means in, in our society. And now it's much more equitable. And, um, you know, when, I mean, my, my oldest child is 20, and uh, at that time it was obvious that I had to take care of everything. And George was um, doing lots of cases and going right back. and. It wasn't even a question that he would have paternity. And so the burden was on me to figure out, well, how am I going to find my way back uh, to my work? And it was a very, very tough time. Now, Sharon, uh, how did it work for you five years ago or so? When yeah, you five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, so for me, I think I felt like I wanted it to be not noticed. I mean, that a lot mm -hmm. of it back then yeah, is that's what it was I was like. trying so much to fit in. Right. So um, we actually. Um, tried to plan the delivery so it would happen during my fellowship and time so I could start on staff the same day everybody else did. Now, now I think like, why did I need to go on faculty on July 1st? You're like, what? But anyway, I, we you did it. You felt like but you the wanted timing to. The yeah. timing very yeah. much worked. Yeah. I took, I had 12 weeks off. Now, I could have had my then paid leave as a faculty instead of a fellow. That probably would have made yeah. more sense. And I took 12 weeks off and started a um, new job, first time faculty job with uh, a three month old and um, and really tried to just blend in and act like to my peers that it hadn't really happened to me mm -hmm. even though obviously I'm running to pump and hide and there weren't you know there's no lactation rooms back then mm -hmm. so it was it really was one of those things where I felt like I was thrilled and we were thrilled and it was a very much a planned child uh, um, <laughs> like down to the ovulation kit and, okay, we're going to do it, and now you know, you're pregnant. Um, but I also felt like you could, you know, at the time, I felt, rightly or wrongly, I couldn't necessarily celebrate being a mother at work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I, and I think that um, there were a few other, um, subsequently, a few other um, cardiology women at, at Mayo that, and we actually had kids around the same age, Maggie Redfield and Patty Pelica and Sharon Mulvey. Um, and then that became a little bit easier, at least when we were together with our little kids, we could do that. But. And, and what did, well, how was it for you? I mean, it's a breeze. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there was no paternity leave. I, yeah. I may have taken a few days off when the first one was born. Clearly, for me, and Sharon was doing all of the work. I think part of this is generational, but also, especially in the early years, we were talking before about uh, just managing duties. Part of it was generational, I think, but more of it was skill sets. I mean, 
Sharon's the organizer and the one who can keep a calendar. I mean, if it was up to me, the kids would just be home playing with cardboard boxes. <laughs> they wouldn't have gone out at all. That could be good, all. too, nowadays. <laughs> yeah. And, I, you, know, and you talk about the things that you do. You know, I paid the bills and did all the paperwork for the nanny, and he said, like, if, if Sharon ever leaves me, I'm going to have to fire the nanny because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I can speak a little bit of how, what it's like to have a baby in fellowship, both from father's perspective and uh, maybe what I observed Stephanie going through. And though there's no paternity leave uh, in effect, really. I took, it's I think, crazy, right? I think I took three days all in a row, though, in a row. Mm -hmm. But... Um, <laughs> three days in a row. In a row. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long but, weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a long weekend. <laughs> and I've been to three different training programs now, and for the most part, fathers mm -hmm. don't take paternity leave. Maybe a week at most, mm -hmm. but it's not a common thing, even now. Uh, but... For mothers, I think it's even harder because they want to come, come back to work because they feel stigmatized if they don't. But uh, you can probably speak more about what you went through and yeah. uh, so, what it was like so having a baby. So since he couldn't yeah. help you, yeah. how did it go? <laughs> so I don't know. Um, so where I was, um, so they give you men and women get one month. So my, the guys that were above uh, in training, they actually said, don't worry. I had three kids in uh, fellowship. You can get three months. I'm like, what? <laughs> so all these uh, men that were uh, fellows uh, actually got a lot of paternity leave, but they had no backlash of like how they per were perceived. So that was, uh, I felt encouraged mm -hmm. to go on maternity That's good. leave. Yeah. Um, I did uh, f uh, my four weeks and um, and then I took one more week, uh, which was my vac vacation. So mm. I did a total of six. Mm. And I think the national average is like around that or... I know you yeah. know a lot about this because yeah. you're rewriting <laughs> yeah. some of this. So it's like six to eight. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not a lot. And when you come out of like a surgery after... It was a C-section, so it takes come, that much time to it, get back. So on you're your coming feet. back to a lab, and it just brings complications after, which was my case. Mm. So it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, it's tough. I remember it vividly. It was like I didn't want people to say, "Well, she's pregnant. She just had a child. She can't be like with us, you know, interventional cardiology." And I wanted to just go right back, mm -hmm. yeah. right yeah. back. I mean literally right back with the hospital band to make sure that nothing was missed, that my, that as if it just didn't happen. And isn't that just really, really I mean, and that was, shameful. I mean, I didn't have to go back to the lab because I was going for transition. But in my mind, if I didn't start the same day that all the other new staff started, mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. would be yeah. like Sometimes. something, the, yeah. The yeah. stigma, the stigma yeah. was huge. And, uh, and probably still is. Still is. Yeah. And I think that we are all hearing that and how do we change that what how do we change that who has i think culture has to come from leaders right mm -hmm. leaders of organizations of divisions of departments who prioritize family leave and are vocal about that and make and it take clear it themselves take it themselves yes and encourage people to take th then culture will change more rapidly so you're a director of fellowship program how does that uh yeah, it's what do you what what do you what have you done? Have you implemented this? Did it come from leadership? I mean, it sounds like you got it somewhat figured out. Yeah, well, I have to say we're very fortunate because the partners, um, which is the organization um, that um, encompasses Mass General and the Brigham, from the partners' um, leadership level, they recently sort of reconfigured the parental leave policy, so it was uniform. I think there was a recognition that there was a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in how each division employed their parental leaves. Maternity leave, what did any, did people have paternity leave policies? Some did, some didn't, some people, you know, thought about it differently. So they took an approach to just try to ensure that that was uniform for all trainees in all of our fellowship That's programs great. across all departments and divisions. Mm -hmm. Um, not again, not only maternity leave, but paternity leave as well, um, and not only for live people who are birthing babies themselves, but also if they're adopting. So it was a you know a widespread change, and I think it was up to the program directors to ensure that those policies were being talked about, discussed, and followed. And so it so it so happened to coincide with our program having a number of trainees who were. Um, 
pregnant and planning on having um, children. And you know what I realized is that each fellow has sort of a unique journey and unique needs. And when you have a three-year training program, there's a lot more flexibility to ensure that that trainee ha achieves all the competencies by the time you have to sign off on them being a mm -hmm. cardiologist. Interventional or a procedural-based specialty that's a single year, it's a little bit of a different um, a little bit of a different thing because mm -hmm. you want to ensure that when you graduate that fellow at the end of the year, they have the technical competencies to be independent in the lab. But I think there are ways to yeah. complement that. I yep. mean, there are ways we know that, yes, if you need a certain number of procedures, I'm sure we can rotate that Right. particular fellow when they come back yeah. into programs where they right. would absolutely get those, whether it's within the same fellowship program or even getting them right. to be a visiting fellow in another lab. Right. I'm, I'm sure there are ways that there we are. can do this. We did that exact thing. We, we, um, we had a fellow, and I hope I'll, I'll speak about her. I, th I don't think she would mind, but she, oh. she had, um, I think, her second child during interventional fellowship. And what we did for her is at the end of her fellowship, she stayed on for several months. And certainly by the time that she finished uh, her training with that extra time, she was more than ready. In fact, she's terrific, more than ready to go out there on her own. Right. But I will say for her, she felt both very stigmatized mm -hmm. and very self-conscious about her own skill set when she was coming back from, from maternity leave because she felt that mm -hmm. like she was behind her peers. And that was a, that was a really hard thing for her um, to, to manage. And I think institutionally, we did not manage it very well either. I think that we, we as a group did not fully recognize it. And, and we sort of got that feedback from her at the end. And it made us really take a long, hard look at ourselves and said, what, what could we have done better here? Because we didn't give her the adequate support. We thought we were doing all we needed, just tack on an extra couple months at the end. But we weren't addressing, I think, some of these other uh, you know, right. emotional Important needs, emotional um, needs that, that go through that, that really affected her quality of life during yeah. that year. Yeah. I think from the experience side, though, I think for one thing, hearing your story about taking six weeks off after a C-section and and only being given four weeks, it seems to me like that has to change. But I think whether you took six weeks or twelve weeks. From the senior standpoint, that is a blip in time it in your career. It is right. And so figuring out how we can so destigmatize it, so the fact that you guys you know, essentially took a year off and you're, <clears throat> you're doing fine and you're glad that you did. Yeah. And I leaned out when my kids were little and had plenty of energy to lean back in when, I, yeah. when they were out of the house. So I think talking about the career arcs of men and women and making them more flexible, not just flexible by the day, but you know, if you took six months off to care for that new baby, you can still be an interventionalist, right? And I think we, we who are in leadership and um, need to start talking about that and... Um, no, there's no question, but there is, it's such a good point, but it doesn't feel like that when you're in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you probably wanted to come back, right? Or I wanted to come back. Yeah, you want to come back. I right? want to come back, and I wanted to come back, and I was actually doing funny things. The things that I was reading to the baby, what I was like breastfeeding, it's like journals and articles, <laughs> because they're gonna, <laughs> they only need so to- So your mark. baby's writing a New England Journal article? <laughs> yes, honestly, they only need to hear the voice of the mom. So I was no. like, I'll read and learn, and but you will now, too. But now he knows, 0 0.05 is statistically significant. <laughs> <laughs> Good, you know. That will be their first word. <laughs> I remember getting my first job right out of Interventional Cardiology Fellowship, and I was pregnant. And before anyone in the world knew, I had to tell my boss. Mm -hmm. And I felt terrible because they had been so amazing to kind of save this spot for me, sure. recruit me into this wonderful position. And I knew that I was going to be putting a burden on the other people in my group. And the thing that my the director of our program, our, our chief at the time, said, he said, nine months is nothing. I hired you for the long haul. Oh. And in that single statement, all of my fears and anxieties just mm -hmm. took a step down. And I realized that it was going to be OK. We were going to figure it out. And, and so on the one hand, it is the policies that are important that we have to change. But on the other hand, it's the culture mm -hmm. and culture. leadership from the very top, both men and women, to tell everyone how to kind of navigate these waters. And even each one of our pregnancies was different. And to mm -hmm. your point of having to individualize it, 
even for the same person, mm -hmm. you can have different needs right. each time. And, and we definitely can get there, but it takes that kind of leadership to change the culture. There's this term called the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood bonus, where you know if a man has a child, people's perception of them is inc increases. Like, oh, he's so good at his job and he's a father. And when the same thing happens to a woman, their opinion of that woman tends to go down. They think, oh, well, she's distracted now. How is she gonna focus on her work? Mm -hmm. And, and I've realized the same thing. Sometimes, you know, we used to have a Saturday morning calf conference. And one time, one of the interventional fellows brought her baby. And I, and I remember thinking at the time, how does she concentrate on a calf conference with her baby there? Now that I've had three kids, I know she must have been so committed that she got her baby up and got her baby to this conference at eight in the morning on a Saturday. Wow. And, uh, you know. I've never done that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> But I but, think you know it's it's, it's right. checking ourselves and mm -hmm. our preconceptions yeah. and trying and the to the implicit understand. bias. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All I think the other thing is um, I think women have to stop thinking about themselves being burdens to others, That's because true. when we talk about yeah. having babies, that is something that the men in the room can't do. So if we don't do it. Um, the human race will die out. And so, and, and so and, and right back. And, and so when we start talking, really be doing cardiologist. When we start talking about women chose to do this, well, usually someone chose to do that with them. And I think if we start, if we start thinking about it as, as a joint thing and as about how this is good for all of us and, um, and less about the individual and thinking about us a burden, because if we achieve the goal of cardiology, say being 50% women, this will be more of an issue. So mm -hmm. we should assume it is going to be normal yeah. right. that babies are going to be born while people are in an interventional fellowship. Yeah. And we're just going to have a It's our fertile bunch. time. Yes. I think it Otherwise, has to be set as an expectation that yeah. the women will get pregnant and they will have babies oh. in fellowship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I know, it's but checking. Right now, I think it's just people, assumed. I think yeah. And if that are, happens, um, check the box. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're scared of it. They avoid the subject altogether. It's like, God forbid a fellow gets pregnant, or God forbid a resident gets pregnant, because then everybody has to pitch in and do something. But if it's an expectation, then it's like, all right, what are the steps we need to do if, when this fellow, when this resident uh, becomes pregnant? Mm -hmm. What are the steps, when. what do we need to do? When. Not if, when. I think yeah. to Sharon's point as yeah. well, this exact, is that we have to think about this, as, you know, if, if a system cannot absorb one human being taking <laughs> several months off, there's a major problem yeah. with that system, right? right? And we spent some time thinking about this in our fellow because we found that when some of our fellows who were t the first ones to take leave, they really felt like they didn't have many other people they could tap on for coverage. That actually was our problem. You know, we didn't have enough flexibility in the system, and it turned out that, you know, we were able to expand the fellowship program to provide more flexibility so people could take the personal mm -hmm. leaves when they needed to and not feel like they were tapping on their, you know, uh, on their friends um, to help pitch in or cover at, you know, um, in a way that felt like it was burdensome. So identifying opportunities where we can create more flexibility for everyone mm -hmm. so that that allows personal leaves or parental leaves is really important. Uh, the problem is that takes money and investment. So, Freddie, um, you're now in, a, in the corporate world. What is, how does it work over there? Yeah, um, it's different, world. right? Like, yeah. uh, I, I think one of the things, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind that I think systematizing it makes sense, for example, uh, but, but I think about if there was a third fellow, uh, would I have gotten enough cases during an interventional fellowship? Like, the, uh, of course, you can work all that stuff. You gotta, you gotta figure it out. But it would out. have to be like one of these structural things mm -hmm. that, that addresses this and doesn't leave people uh, in tougher positions. So, I, I, but from my perspective, solvable problem. Um, uh, on the other hand, in the corporate world, um, it is a competitive advantage uh, to attract the best talent to have an appropriate paternity or maternity leave. And, and for our third child, four months off. That's great. And my CEO took four months off. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference between my CEO and perhaps the CEO of Stanford, or let's say our chair, they're, they're slightly different age brackets. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they won't have that opportunity to express themselves in that type of support, which I think is incredibly important. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I do think market forces driving uh, for the best talent that goes to these amazing programs should be partially, you know, if you come here, we'll support you as a whole, not just for you to provide service, seeing 65 patients in clinic in a day. And because do you really need 64 patients to be competent? Can you do it with 50? 
Um, uh, I think those things, so, which gets to the next point, which is, you know, all of us around this table react, particularly your, your baby, react well to literature. Yeah. Um, and so uh, <laughs> outcomes is important. I do think like showing that, you know, saying that if you took a year off, um, um, uh, didn't impact your career is different than like, here's the differences, for example, uh, uh, again, my title is usually husband. Uh, uh, Celine is incredibly productive, has done uh, a ton uh, of which uh, I, I couldn't be more supportive of. Uh, and she took a year off for her first baby, second baby, right? I can't remember. It's all blurred. <laughs> yeah. Um, one I'm of the three. Her one of the three got her off. It was a research year. It yeah, wasn't time time off. Not not a year off, but a year not in the lab. That's right. right. Um, yes. And I think yes. that's that's the way. That's I, but that's kind of time off for me. Uh, it's, not, <laughs> it's a different different yeah. story. Uh, so in, in that context, her her career has been amazing. And I think like showing that even if it's with a limited number of people who have gone through it across the country, or perhaps in Europe where this is much more acceptable uh, in terms of leave, or even up, up north in Canada where I grew up, uh, where people take significant leave on a regular basis, and showing that that doesn't really impact your publication numbers, your, uh, your skills and ability and reputation, and however it else we measure it. enhances it. Yeah, of course. I, I, I can promise you that everyone knew that I was, on, that I was pregnant uh, when the publications went up, because <laughs> I wouldn't go in the lab, well, so there was it was during the time of breaking therapy, yeah. and I was really <laughs> scared, and so mm -hmm. I, the publications were just incredible, and so there is a, there are ways that we could complement and actually do do better. But listening to how the corporate world thinks about this is actually getting the most talented, the best people, and you become competitive for that yeah. kind of, and making cardiology that kind of a subspecialty. So the talent pool of women who are running away from cardiology because of the culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of how we perceive maternity leave, parental leave, whether it's during pregnancy or not, but even during child rearing, which is incredibly important. And at the time that people are running away from that, we're losing this incredible talent pool. Thank you so much for being here. I can't thank, thank you, you enough. And we'll hope to have you back, maybe with the babies. <laughs> <laughs>